Like any other well-adjusted adult, I often like to sit and stare at my cameras, which got me thinking, what if I repainted a Minolta X700? No, not old reliable over here, but I think eBay can help us out. $87.20 later and we have our new victim. Now I went out of my way to find the worst condition X700 that I could and though technically I won the bid on an even worse one, the seller tried to scam me so here we are. Despite looking like it was buried underground for at least 20 years, the camera doesn't seem to have any physical damage to it. But as the listing suggested, the camera is non-functioning. Now luckily for me, I know an ancient secret that not a lot of people are aware of, and you're in luck because I'm willing to share it with you today. All you have to do is clean. The problem usually lies within the battery compartment, which I'll clean out with an eraser and a bit of rubbing alcohol. By polishing up the surface, you can usually remove the oxidation that's built up over the years and create good electrical contact again. And just like that, our camera is now fully functioning once more. Upon opening up the back, you can see that there's probably more fungus in here than there is light seal foam left, so that's gonna have to be addressed later on. Here's all the sh** I'll be using in order to CLA the camera, and you might be thinking to yourself right now, wow, that looks like a lot of shit. And to that I reply, yes, welcome to camera repair, mother -fucker. I don't even have enough room on my workbench to push the shit out of frame. Taking off the top cover of the X700 is pretty straightforward, just like any other camera. It's just a matter of taking out the five screws, the ISO dial, the rewind knob, the shutter speed dial, and the advance lever. Now before we start yanking away at the top cover, we gotta be careful because there's a whole mess of spaghetti waiting for us underneath. There are a lot of people that won't mess with these electromechanical cameras because, you know, they're afraid of a little soldering. But let me say this, if a 12 year old factory worker in Asia can do it, then I would say my chances are pretty medium. As you can see, we're off to a great start as my $10 soldering iron immediately sh** the bed which normally wouldn't be a problem, but it turns out I have zero dollars left in my bank account. Luckily for me, my friend was willing to lend me his Hako for some reason. And let me tell you, after using this thing for just a few minutes, he's never getting it back. Removing the four screws on the base plate reveals a nice big area of corrosion around the tripod mount to the left of the battery tray. The fact that the camera is still working is a good sign, but it doesn't really bode well for the rest of the internals. My guess is that somebody set this camera down in an area of standing water on whatever surface that it was placed on. Loosening the top flex PCB to get at the prism requires a little bit of uh, order of operations bullshit because we're gonna need to free the shutter speed assembly as well as the frame counter and advance assembly before we can even get at the strap lug to remove the plastic shell which removes the plastic shroud around the lens mount which allows us to access the wires that are soldered to the resistor band for the aperture and on top of all that we have to desolder even more wires to get it lifted out of position. I guess this is why people don't really like working on these cameras. Underneath is where I made my first major mistake on this project. Now, if you're crazy enough to follow along, I would highly recommend desoldering all of the wires on that lower PCB that attaches to the battery tray. My reasoning for that is because the solder pads that hold the battery tray into place are extremely prone to lifting off of the flex PCB with even minimal heat. I've worked on a number of these cameras and I've had it happen to the left side solder pad more times than it really should although it could always just be a skill issue. Flex PCB is pretty fragile, so 
Rather than what I show here, I would really recommend just fully desoldering it and removing it to prevent any unnecessary damage from occurring. You pretty much have to desolder everything anyway, so it's kind of just more trouble than it's worth to do the wiggle method. I would highly advise against getting rid of any of these little plastic pieces that are around the prism because they help prevent shorting against the flex PCB. The focusing screen sits on top of three screws that help level it, so you're going to want to make sure not to lose those when you pull the focusing screen out. Last thing I have to do is remove the metal arm that charges the mirror when the film is advanced. This will allow us to separate the mirror box from the back of the camera. I have to be careful to do this gently because there are a lot of wires that are tucked in precariously in various areas, and also a number of wires that I forgot to desolder. I don't know if I said it earlier, but you basically have to desolder every single wire at one point or another. So it can get a little bit tedious and you're basically completely f***ed if you don't take enough reference photos as you go. With the mirror box out of the camera, we can separate the shutter. You can see the two holes on either side of the film gate, and if everything's tuned properly, you'll be able to see the edge of the curtain on either side, depending on whether or not the shutter is primed or not. Now that we have our camera mise en place ready to go, it's time to get to cleaning. I'm going to start by using my airbrush to blow most of the loose dirt and debris off of the camera components. When you do this, you're going to want to make sure that you have your coffee sitting on the other side of all the components you're dusting off. So all the loose dirt and debris flies into your open coffee cup to add extra flavor. Now that we're all fueled up, we can pour out some isopropyl alcohol and start working on those disintegrated light seals. As you can see, they didn't use the worst quality light seal foam known to man. And even 40 years later, these things hold up pretty well. And they usually come out in one large piece. Oh. I'm giving the light seal channels one more wipe down to get rid of any loose dirt and debris before busting out some fresh light seal foam. I'm not going to go too far into detail about the light seals because uh, it's probably one of the easier jobs you can do on a camera. I'm just manually cutting the light seal foam to size and replacing all the foam around the interior of the camera as needed. Okay, the cleaning is really not that interesting, so I'm going to gloss over most of it. But I will show you the lubing, because, you know, everyone likes a little bit of lubing. And there are a lot of lubrication points that need to be gone over in these things, but I will show you the basics. Essentially, what you want to do is apply grease to all of the friction-based latch points, and you want to apply oil to the little pivot points. You don't really want to put too much on, you just want just enough to keep things gliding smoothly without gumming up the internal components. As you can imagine, any amount of dirt and shit that gets within the camera is going to stick immediately to the grease and oil that you put on here. Now our mirror is looking more like a petri dish than a mirror, so we're going to have to wipe that clean with a bit of hydrogen peroxide and a clean microfiber cloth in order to get it looking pristine once again. 
I'm not sure exactly what type of plastic was used to make these focusing screens, but the problem with the plastic focusing screen is you can basically breathe on it and it'll get damaged because any amount of friction is gonna scratch that shit right up and then it's just gonna haunt you every time you go to take a photo. Now here's a nice little bit of engineering from the team over at Minolta. This piece of factory scotch tape keeps the mirror magnet nice and clean from any sand, dirt, and debris that gets within the mirror box. We're gonna wanna wipe that down with some isopropyl alcohol to make sure everything's cleaned up. And from here, I'm just gonna finish up cleaning and lubing the rest of the mirror mechanisms. Now that everything's nice and clean, we'll start to put everything back together again. The main failure point on these Minolta X700 cameras are the aperture and shutter capacitors that sit down underneath and above the upper PCB. Now, as I mentioned earlier, if you have the blue solid tantalum capacitors, you probably don't need to f around with this if you're doing a CLA. But with the later models that have electrolytic capacitors, I prefer to do preventative maintenance ahead of time to make sure that issues don't arise when you're out in the field shooting. You'll be f***ing malding if your camera shits the bet on you when you're three shots into a $25 roll of film. When you attach the shutter back onto the mirror box, both the shutter and the mirror box need to be primed or else it won't seat properly. And as you can see, when you drop into place, it'll release the shutter in the mirror and it'll just lock right where it needs to go. It's pretty cool actually. Now we need to make sure that this little timing mark is pointing straight at the center of this gear or else the advanced lever is gonna feel sloppy or even worse, it's gonna place too much tension onto the shutter curtains. You can also see the little brass eccentric screw which controls the fine tuning adjustment for the overcharge gear. With that properly adjusted, we can put the battery tray back into the camera and we're gonna have that solder pad issue to contend with. I tried a number of different methods in order to fix the solder pad. Ow, f And there's probably a product that exists that would have done exactly what I needed, but after a number of failed attempts, I decided just to solder a jumper wire from the battery lead onto the nearest solder pad. I got 90% of the way done with this and I got to this really fun and exciting moment when I realized that I missed a wire that was supposed to be soldered into like the mirror box and I had to completely disassemble the camera again in order to get it back into place. All right, now that we've gotten this thing back together again, we can go ahead and check for the functions of the camera and um, wow, look at that. Uh, it doesn't work. It looks like we have no power, so I'm gonna go back underneath to where the solder pad is and uh, as any self-respecting repairman would do, I'm gonna just super glue it down to the board. Oh, and look at that, now it works again. By the way, um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm taking repairs, so yeah, if you wanna send me your camera, let me know. All right, so now that we got this thing working, um, I turned off the camera and uh, it immediately stopped working. All right, guys, so here's the situation with this. I'm at my wits end with this thing. Not that I had a lot of wit to begin with, but I cannot for the life of me figure out why it is not working. Um, I've, as you can see, we've got everything out. I've replaced the bottom board and power, whatever the fuck, battery holder with a known good working one. I've replaced all the capacitors again with known good working ones. I've tried umpteen different batteries. I've re-soldered a lot of the joints thinking maybe it was a cold, there were cold joints or something. I can't figure out why this isn't working. So I've got one more thing to try before I pretty much give up because it could be f***ing anything. There's a trick. I saw a video by, I forget who it was in the video, but it was, I'll link the video. I guess sometimes what can happen is the voltage will drop between these two yellow wires. And if you solder them together directly, it can solve the problem. So I'm gonna try doing that. Hopefully this works, fingers crossed. Now I may be a lazy f***er, but I'm nothing if not persistent. And in the end, I did figure it out. The entire problem was just that the camera was jammed and there was no electrical issue at all. So I basically wasted three days for nothing trying to get this thing fixed for the video. And uh, yeah, I, it took me all of five seconds to get it fixed once I realized that it was jammed.
Oh, and I also took the opportunity to tune the shutter speeds using the brass eccentric screw that you can see at the front left of the camera. Here are the results from before and after the CLA. I was able to get all the speeds within tolerance, except for one 125th, which I was able to get within 0 .00038 of tolerance. Now, after all that f***ing around, you'd probably think I would just cut my losses and turn this into a Minolta X700 CLA video, but uh, no, I'm not. I will press onward. But before that, we need to get a few things prepped and ready to go. There are a few small components and mechanisms which need to get disassembled before we can start masking and painting. There's the self-timer and exposure lock switch, as well as the ISO dial, and the little metal rings that clip on underneath the two knobs. Unfortunately, we're gonna have to melt through these little plastic rivets that they use to hold the rear molded grip onto the film door of the camera. Now I gotta give it to Minolta, they really knew what the f they were doing with these adhesives because you can peel these things off and they'll stick right back on again like the day they rolled out of the factory. I'm gonna make some light modifications to this plastic back piece. I'm not gonna need the film reminder slot, um, I'm sure that won't come back to bite me in the ass later in the future. Really the main reason is because the ISO ASA scale is completely scratched up and fairly unsightly. So I'm just gonna score it a few times with a utility knife and then snap it right off. This weight reduction should probably add about 10 horsepower to our uh, overall rig. Next, I'm just gonna smooth and round out the edge with a rotary tool before finishing it with some sandpaper. At this point, we can just scuff sand all these plastic pieces to make sure the paint adheres properly. Unfortunately, I wasn't really too careful about what grid I chose when I did this. And I think I used 220, which left some deeper scratches than we really wanna have on these pieces. Now we can just throw them into the old ultrasonic cleaner and get them ready to go. At this point, we're gonna start experimenting to see what we can use to remove the paint on the top and bottom covers of the camera. I'm starting with lacquer thinner, which I've applied to a paper towel, and I should probably be wearing gloves while handling. As you can see, it didn't really remove much other than some trace amounts, so I decided to pour a little bit more on and let it sit before doing whatever the f it is I'm doing here with the screwdriver. That also failed, so I thought a gentle application of heat might do the trick. And by gentle, I mean putting a paint stripping heat gun right up against the plastic and seeing how long it took before it decided to warp, which it did within a relatively short amount of time. All right, let's move back over to the more toxic methods of paint removal. I found this decrepit can of oven cleaner in my basement, which appears to have most of its remaining contents stuck to the outside of the can. It's for science. Yeah, that also didn't work at all, so let's try leaving the parts in a bath of isopropyl alcohol overnight. Now, the alcohol didn't do a whole lot except remove most of the leftover dirt on the outside of the parts, but it did soften up all the paint in the lettering which allowed me to peel it up pretty easily with my precision tweezers. At this point I wasn't really sure what to do, so I thought it might be a good idea to leave the parts sitting in lacquer thinner for a few hours. And when I came back, I was pretty excited because it appeared as though the lacquer thinner had taken the paint off of all of the submerged parts. I was a little bit confused when I pulled the top cover out and all the paint was still on it. Turns out, the reason why the lacquer thinner changed color to black is because it dissolved all of the plastic parts <laughs> that were sitting within it. Now after that failure, I got a little bit discouraged, but I still had some more stuff to try. Acetone yielded no result, so I moved on to Coca-Cola and brake fluid, which also did completely nothing. Now this bottom plate you're looking at now is not from the X700, but from a failed experiment I did about a year ago to a Minolta X570. Now as you can see here in an area that I sanded, the primer underneath was getting shiny, which got me a little bit curious to see whether or not this was in fact conductive primer. So I pulled out the multimeter and it turns out I was correct. Now this is pretty interesting because it means the reason why all my paint removal methods failed is because the coating on here isn't paint, it's powder coated. Now, I'm not sure how they actually managed to do this at the factory because I believe that these parts are made out of ABS, which has a pretty low melting point, lower than most powder coat curing temperatures would be. And according to my research, UV cured powder coating didn't really come about until the 1990s, which would have been after this was made. The good and bad thing about powder coating is that there are really only three methods to remove it. You either need to use heat, some kind of really strong chemical stripper, or sandblasting. 
Now, I don't have a sandblaster, and unfortunately, I don't have any friends that have a sandblaster either, so that method is completely off the table. The chemical stripper is off the table because it'll just melt the plastic underneath. And heat is kind of off the table because it will warp and melt the plastic. However, I thought I might be able to bring the temperature up gradually enough to where I wouldn't warp or melt the plastic, but I would loosen up the powder coating. So I unearthed this little toaster oven from the far reaches of my basement, and um, you can see how filthy it is. I'm pretty sure this was my sister's old toaster oven, so yeah, what the f***. But anyway, it'll do the job for us. So, unfortunately, this method also failed, and it turned our pieces into a cursed aluminum foil popcorn. So that means we're just gonna have to press on by spraying paint right over this coating. I was thinking primer might help out with adhesion, so I decanted some of this from a spray can into a little glass jar. And I think I actually got more of it onto my workbench than I did into the jar itself. But that's all right, now we can start masking off our pieces. I wanna keep most of the paint off of any area that isn't going to be seen in the final product to prevent any unnecessary buildup. Okay, so now we've got the parts masked off and ready to go, but we're going to need a place to spray these. So I built myself this pretty awesome, fully OSHA approved RGB edition spray booth. And this should keep all of the overspray flying out the back towards the furnace on the other side of the basement. So I started by airbrushing most of the pieces with primer, and um, as you can see, the flow is pretty fucking terrible. And that's because I didn't thin the primer at all, although I'm not really sure that you're supposed to thin primer, but it was way too thick to go through the 0.3 millimeter nozzle of my $20 airbrush. After 24 hours of dry time, the primer's kind of failing the scratch test here, so I'm just gonna take this little off-cut piece of plastic and use it as a test piece for the base coat. And as you can see here, it's kind of failing miserably as uh, all the paint is kind of just scratching right off of the plastic. But we're gonna just do the right thing and pretend we didn't see that and keep going. At this point, I figured out I had to thin the paint out way more than I had been doing previously to about a 50-50 or even 60-40 thinner to paint ratio. So I was actually getting pretty decent results out of this cheap airbrush. Well, that's not to say I didn't have my fair share of mistakes, and my technique was definitely a little bit lacking. Here you can see where those sandpaper scratches are coming back to haunt me, as uh, they are pretty f***ing visible, even through a few coats of paint. Any of the reject pieces got to swim in the vat of sadness, which, by the color you can tell at this point, has been used rather heavily. Now the problem is, I didn't really account for this quantity of mistakes, though based on my track record, I probably should have. But because I ordered the paint online and I wanted to get this video done, I just used what I had on hand, which happened to be this cheap gloss white enamel. And all I did was just decant this paint and put it through the airbrush over top of the white lacquer paint that I had already put down. Ultimately, I only had the primer on a couple of the pieces and I used the lacquer as a base coat and then the enamel was sprayed down on top of that. Now, this substance right here is a little bit questionable, but it's not what you think. This is actually uh, Minwax Polycrylic, and this is what I'm gonna use for the top coat. Now, right here on the can, it says that this is for wood substrates only, but I'm gonna completely ignore that and spray it over top of the paint anyway. At this point, you're probably thinking, Patrick, why would you risk f***ing up all of that work that you've already done? And you'd be completely right. But the thing is, there's a little voice in the back of my head and it says, trust me, bro. And who am I to argue with that? But in all seriousness, I have seen a number of model builders use floor polish and some other slightly unorthodox methods of clear coating models. And while I haven't seen anyone use this product specifically, it looks suspiciously similar to a lot of the clear coats that they use. It may not be quite as strong as automotive urethane, but it should get the job done. I start out by going in with a light dust coat, which I then flash off by blowing just air onto the part. This creates a somewhat rough texture on the part, which allows the second coat to go on heavier and promote better adhesion. I let the polycrylic dry overnight before sanding out any of the dust that had settled into it, and there was a lot of dust. With the top coat finished, we can finally put our spray booth where it belongs and get to peeling off the masking tape. My masking job was okay, but I did end up having a little bit of tear out on the edges because I waited kind of too long. What I realized as I was doing this is that what I really needed was masking fluid, which for those of you who don't know, it's basically like liquid masking tape. You brush it on and then it dries into this little like rubbery that you can peel. Now moving on to the detailing, 
and it's pretty straightforward because I'm just using black, white, and red, which is simply my logo branding color scheme. Unfortunately, when I was doing the detailing, what I didn't realize is that the polycrylic takes a week or more to fully cure. So in a few areas where I was wiping off the excess paint, I kind of f***ed it because I burned through and melted the polycrylic. Now, this isn't the end of the world. I can still go back and fix it. It's just that I'm going to have to wait before I can wet sand it, and I'm not going to be able to do it before I get this video out. With all the detailing done, we can finally reassemble the camera and get it into its naked, skinless form. There are plenty of imperfections to be seen, but we're not going to look too closely at those. For this project, I procured some crispy white leather to put on the outside of the camera. I'm just tracing the outline of a pattern that I made from the pre-existing skin with a pen. I've had a few people comment on previous videos recommending that I use Pliobond to reapply leather and leatherette to camera bodies, but I haven't gotten around to buying any of that yet, so I'm going to stick with what I know and just use this water-based contact adhesive. I sanded the back of the leather down to try and match the thickness of the spaces where it sits, but it really wasn't my best work. I really wish I could just order it split at the correct thickness, but most distributors don't go below 1.5 millimeters. Now you can see that once I apply the leather onto the body, it really accentuates the differences in the color of the white paint. And while it's not the worst thing in the world, I do think the camera is actually helping a little bit here. The power of hoarding is coming in clutch here as I had just the right size coarse thread screws to hold the plastic piece onto the film door. Hang on, there's one more thing. I forgot I need to reattach the MPS badge to the front of the camera body. I could have done a lot better of a job painting this, but as long as you don't stare at it too long, it looks kind of okay. All right, let's attach a lens and see how it looks. I wasn't sure how the lens was gonna look with the orange and green, and I do think it throws it off a little bit, but I'm not really gonna f with that. Though I do think it's an improvement over my previous paint job. It is still quite rough around the edges with some inconsistencies in paint color. The leather could have been done a lot better. And once again, the top coat wasn't done perfectly and I'm gonna have to go back and polish it up. Not to mention the fact that this was a lot of work for something that's probably gonna fall apart in a week of actual use. But you know, the thing is, it's really more about the lessons that we learn along the way. Like the fact that I'm probably never gonna paint another plastic camera again. But regardless, this one isn't going to live on a shelf. I am actually going to use this as a backup camera body. So I will check in with you guys and let you know how well it holds up. My guess is it's not going to hold up very well. Just for fun, let's see how it looks with the custom wooden grip I made a few videos back. I think that looks pretty sweet, actually. Then again, I'm the guy who made it. If you enjoyed this video, I recommend you check out that custom wood grip video that I just mentioned. I think it's a pretty cool one if you're into this kind of stuff. If you're interested in any of the tools or materials that I used during this video, I'll link as many of them as I can in the description. As always, thank you for taking the time to stop by and watch the video, and until next time, peace.